The Money Show. Investment School. Tonight's investment school is going to sound a little bit like telling the guy who's just fallen off his motorbike to put on a helmet. But uh, Jean-Pierre Fastard, Chief Executive at Protec Capital Management, how to protect your portfolio while well, you're anticipating more crashes, uh, Jean-Pierre, in terms of uh, the, the real sort of calamity we feel like markets are in at the moment. Good evening, Bruce. Yeah, It's been a sort of like a slide, a slow slide up until now. But to your question, I think uh, over time and over a long enough period, there will necessarily be uh, crashes. They are by definition something that um, events that you can't predict. But I'm pretty sure they will happen. I just don't know when. No, this is this is true. At the moment, we feel like we need to protect ourselves. And I think it's probably too late against the precipitous drop-off in SA Inc. shares. What's keeping our market afloat at the moment is the traditional RAND hedges. Some of our resources counters have been quite resilient. But generally, one looks at the South African retail landscape, one looks at the banking shares. They've fallen quite sharply so far this year already. I'm wondering if we're talking about that kind of protection or if we're talking more broadly about the sort of principle of protection into the future if and you know, once this sort of the, there's a bit of a recovery and maybe some stability in markets again. Mm, I think the principle is applicable here. So I'll first touch on the principle. Right. I think in principle, you want to hedge, you want to protect yourself before calamity strikes, before the risk that you think might appear actually appears. So a while back, one might have been concerned about South Africa and the valuation of SA Inc. shares. And at that time, you should have protected yourself by hedging. Now, as you correctly say, I think SA Inc. shares are too cheap. This is not the time to hedge by, for instance, shorting SA Inc. shares. Um, One can hedge yourself by diversifying. That's one way. But um, uh, you can think about what the next calamity might be, what the next risk might be. And as an example, there's some weakness in commodity markets at the moment. And there's a a view out there that maybe the um, opening up in the Chinese economy isn't going as well as people thought it might be. So there are always risks out there that one can seek protection from. The important thing is to seek the protection before the calamity strikes and not in the the crisis. Because if you're looking for protection in the crisis, that protection will be quite expensive. Right. So let's talk about the principles then. I mean, and we go back to the old fashioned rules, these things that are not sexy, these things that um, we, we, when particularly when there is lots of froth and excitement in markets and where Nuspaso is only going one way and that's up and where Bitcoin is only going up. You say to people, you know what you need to do? You need to protect yourself against the downside. And they look at you as if you've had too many gin and tonics at lunchtime. And they sort of and when you start talking about the importance of diversification, people's eyes glaze over. Why would I want to diversify when I clearly am an investment genius? Because look at my track record over the last three weeks. Um, Everything's gone up. I'm brilliant at this investing thing. Diversification is the most, the single biggest, I suppose, differentiator between people who make money consistently and those who go through boom and bust cycles. Yes, I would agree with that. And and it comes down to another principle, which is that the future is inherently uncertain. So if you believe that, and I think every day there are examples of things that happen that we cannot foresee and did not foresee. So if we come from that perspective, then the only way to protect yourself against things happening which you do not expect is to have a diversified portfolio. Now, importantly, Bruce, a lot of people will use hindsight bias and say, oh, but what about all these entrepreneurs, all these founders of businesses like Amazon.com or Apple, or even in the South African context, there's a a few companies that have done very well. And if you held only that one share, you would have outperformed the market and outperformed all your peers. But that's saying it with hindsight bias. So if you don't know what the future entails, and not even the professional investors like myself, Bruce, really know what the future entails. The best thing you can do yes. I've I've been rereading Nassim Taleb's uh, Fooled by Randomness. It's a book that's 20 years old now. Um, And he talks exactly to this point. I mean, you know, you, you start believing your own PR. You start thinking that you're cleverer than everybody else because... 
you've had good success um, in investments and you don't you forget about the fact that the world is an entirely random place where bad things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people, and just you know life happens. And the randomness aspect of it, the the things that you simply cannot predict in that unknowable future, um, is what catches everybody out eventually. Absolutely, and that's why markets are the place that keeps everyone humble, because you might have a few successes in a row. But ultimately, you will get certain things wrong and you will have a drop in your portfolio. So again, whether you're an active investor, you pick your own shares or you're a more passive investor, you buy ETFs or you invest in third party funds. The point is that you need to diversify and don't get swayed by the fact that if you look at just how Bitcoin did or just how that one share did at the moment, it's NVIDIA in the US. And if I only owned NVIDIA, I would be so rich. (laughs) <laughs> that is the wrong way to think about things. And you're going to drive yourself mad if you try and move away from the importance of the principle of diversification. And, and diversification happens in good times. Diversification doesn't happen in times of discontent and problematic markets. I saw somebody posting today, I forget who it was, but somebody saying, you know, diversification is not selling your South African um, shares at 21 to the dollar um, and at beaten down valuations and then taking your money offshore and putting it into NVIDIA, which is this astonishing success story of recent years where returns have been stratospheric and remarkable. That is not diversification. That's, I, I think, I don't know what the term would be, but it's equivalent to economic suicide, I would think. Yes. So so the whole point of tonight's discussion is protecting your investment portfolio, Bruce. And diversification is to protect yourself against things that are outside of your control. But you make another important point, and that is something that is within your control, and that is your own decision making. And what normally happens with retail investors, exactly, they are emotional. They normally make the wrong decision at the wrong time. I can't tell you how many retail investors have approached us in the last two weeks saying that now they want to take their money offshore. Now they're interested in investing offshore. They weren't interested when the rand was 15 rand to the dollar or lower, but now that we're touching 20, now they want to do that. So another important point of protecting yourself and protecting the value of investments is protecting your investments from yourself from your own emotional decision-making. And that's a very important point. What are you saying to people right now, Jean-Pierre? What are you saying to people right now? Uh, when they come to you and they say, right, the round has gone from 15 to 20, um, so we better get our money out of the country. How do you convince them that it's not going from 20 to 25 or from 20 to 30, which, depending on where you look on the worldwide internet web, um, there are many who are making those sorts of forecasts, predicting an Argentina or a Turkey-style meltdown. Mm. Look, look, it's not impossible. So again, it comes to that respect for the fact that the future is inherently uncertain. So what I tell people is, firstly, stay calm. Try to be unemotional in your decision-making and try not to make any extreme decisions or extreme positioning in your portfolio. So part of the extreme positioning means that coming into the current grand weakness, hopefully you did not only have SA Inc. shares, you were already diversified. And if not, you can take a few steps, a few small steps towards better diversification, but don't go so extreme and sell all your Inc. shares and move everything offshore. So try at most times to keep a diversified portfolio, which which will change over time. If your offshore shares have done very well the past five years because of brand weakness or otherwise, and your SA Inc. shares have shrunk in value, then you must re-look at your portfolio or re-look at the funds you've invested in and potentially rebalance, say once a year, to get back to something that looks a little bit better in terms of the balance between diversification. So that's what I'm telling people. Don't make any rash decisions and don't take any extreme bets in the positioning of your portfolio. And the, again, very old-fashioned time proven time tested principles of long-term perspective and patience now these are not things that we are naturally endowed with long-term perspective is like breakfast time tomorrow patience is we'll do it yesterday and uh, unfortunately particularly in difficult times i i suspect those 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 attributes are in even shorter supply than normal Absolutely. And it's also a generational thing. So I, I, I'm, I'm getting this feeling that more recently, 
there's even less patience that there was in the past and less of a long-term perspective and more a, an, a, a, a need for immediate gratification because we are so used to everything being instant, whether it's on your phone or even your meals, uh, any edu uh, 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 entertainment you might want, everything is on call. Everything is just a push of a button away. And that means your investment returns should also just be a push of a button away. It should be easy. It should be quick. You should be generating 20% uh, per annum, if not more, year in, year out. Now, part of this patience is to understand that that's not how markets work. And if it was how markets work, we would all be rich. And the market has this way, again, to humble all of us and to take away the money from those who are impatient and to divert it to the pockets of those who are patient. So when you have investments, Bruce, and hopefully people have got long-term investments being exposure to equities, they do not move in a straight line. They go up and they go down. And sometimes they go down a lot. And it's only through having patience and maintaining that long-term perspective that you can ride out the ups and the downs. And over the long term, you will make a decent return, but only if you stick to it and ignore the short-term fluctuations. And that's harder to do than it sounds. Um, the 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 idea of a reasonable expectation, and uh, and each one of us will have a different view on what is reasonable and what our expectations are, because all of us want to make the greatest amount of money in the shortest possible period of time, taking the least amount of risk, because we don't want to lose our money, but we want to make it. We want to double it. In, you know, we want to double it in five years, and then we want to double it again in the three years after that, and double it again. And that that sense of realism is, I think, quite a quite a scarce commodity. Absolutely. Again, let's take the interest rate cycle where we are now. If you look at how low the prime rate was uh, only eighteen months ago, and where we are now, it's it, most people's uh, uh, installments, whether on your house or your car, have gone up by fifty percent, if not more, over the last eighteen months. And uh, similarly, on the on the positive side, your savings, your cash in the bank, uh, the interest rate linked to that has also gone up substantially. And you can always refer to the interest rate you're getting in your bank account to sort of calibrate you about what is reasonable. And if you want to have zero capital risk, if you want to have your money in the bank where you know it'll never be less than the amount you deposited, then you know what the interest rate is you are getting. That's a taxable rate. And if you look at then the after-tax rate, that's an indication what you can then expect from the equity market plus, say, 2 to 3%. And that sounds low, Bruce, and this is what most people miss. An additional 2 to 3%, broadly speaking, for the additional risk of taking equity risk, of having short-term fluctuations that can mean that the value of your equity investment can be less than what you put in. But that is what is reasonable. And if you put that all together at the moment, it means that low double digit return say 11 to 12 percent per annum is a reasonable return and anyone that promises you 20 percent or more is probably not making a honest projection of what your investment could grow to in the future and, and if they are delivering that return and they do it more than once or twice in succession you really do need to be asking questions about how they're doing it and what they're up to because we've seen far too many people caught on the wrong side of those sorts of arrangements unfortunately uh, in, in recent times this is where a lot of people get excited uh, about hedge funds hedge funds are notorious about the fact that they te historically um tended to not really be hedge funds and many of them were long only funds that you know, just took big risk and were well rewarded for taking that risk and charged very very high fees for that risk uh, i wonder whether hedge funds the role of hedge funds becomes more accentuated at times like this hmm. so firstly for those who might not know the the term hedge fund means a fund that can take leverage and normally that leverage is via shorting so you go long and short you make money both from the rising price of an asset and the falling price of an asset. So different shares, for instance, to make money, whether they go up in price or go down in price. And to your point, when we have times like this, where SA Inc shares are down sharply, but gold shares and uh, RAND hedges are up sharply, that is fertile ground for a hedge fund. Hedge funds in South Africa have now been regulated for eight years, since 2015. So in this time, at the in the early days, 
the, the type of criticisms you referred to, Bruce, you might have said they were valid, but now eight years later, the, the cowboys that might have been on the fringes of the industry have been shaken out. And the people who are left in the industry, the long running hedge funds, anyone can go to the websites of these hedge fund managers. They can see the returns of the funds. These are regulated investment vehicles and they are generally above average, even after above average fees. And that speaks to the fact that the South African hedge fund industry is very healthy. And it's still unfortunately something that it's called under indexed in retail portfolios. Retail investors are still a bit skittish uh, towards hedge funds. But it's, it really explain, is a proposition that more retail investors. Explain what you mean by under indexed, because that's a slightly mm. technical term. Yes. So if you look in the US, the size of the hedge fund industry relative to the traditional long only industry, the mutual fund industry, which we call the unit trust industry, um, it is multiples larger than that relative size in South Africa. So if South Africa's broader savings and investment industry was of a similar structure than the US, the hedge fund industry in South Africa would be at least five times larger than what it is. More than five times more money would be managed by South African hedge fund managers than that are actually managed by them. So there's a lot of opportunity for the industry to grow in South Africa. What is your sense of markets at the moment, uh, JP? You've got a very successful track record. You've made a lot of money for investors over many years. You've taken some significant positions um, uh, at different times in the investment cycle. I mean, earlier you intimated that South Africa is just looking insanely cheap at the moment. It doesn't mean it gets cheaper. It, it doesn't get cheaper before um, it, it goes up again one day. W w where are you sort of, where's your mind? Yes, yeah, so, so a few thoughts. The first one is that undeniably things are tough in South Africa. You see that every day with results, whether it's Pepco and Tiger Brands today or a whole host of other companies that have recently reported, things are tough. But there's a price for everything. And sometimes even the tough outlook that is realistic in terms of what might happen in winter and the rest of this year and even into next year is discounted into share prices. And I think we are roughly there, Bruce. So still being, uh, like I said, uh, not dogmatic about the future, having respect for the inherent uncertainty about the future. I do believe that there's a lot of opportunity in SA Inc shares. Similarly, if you already have taken your money offshore, there's a lot of opportunity globally, but I don't think now is a good time to, to uh, take your rands and exchange them for dollars. When it comes to offshore markets, um, Japan looks quite cheap after many years. Now, if, if we really want to have a fright, Bruce, um, I would remind a lot of listeners that Japan has still not reached the market high of the Nikkei index that it reached in the late 1980s. Exactly. So, so we're talking we're talking like 35 years of markets still not reaching the previous high. And that is why, again, a hedge fund, which can go long and short, is particularly interesting at times like this. Yeah. In the US, I think the AI movement is very strong, but it's probably in a bubble at the moment. If you look at the, the share price performance of NVIDIA and a lot of the other shares. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, South Africa cheap at the moment. Offshore, some opportunities, but not in AI. And if you diversify across geographies, across currencies, it means you'll get some of these right, you'll get some of them wrong. But over time, you should do quite okay with your investment portfolio. Investment School Headmaster this evening, Jean-Pierre Fastard, Chief Executive at Protea Capital Management.